page 492. So we started saying yesterday the people, uh, are, uh, they saw that Moshe Rabbeinu was late. And the proper perspective is to think of people who are out in a desert without supplies, without anything, without leadership now. And Moshe Rabbeinu is like, Vayikol ha'om al Aaron, vayomre lov kuma seilenu Elohim, make a, uh, a, a God for us. Asher yolchul lefanenu, ki ze Moshe yisha shehelonu meretz yitzayim lo yodanu mehoyolo. We don't know what happened to him. So the commentaries explain almost as one that what they wanted was, they saw Moshe Rabbeinu as an intermediary between them and God. What they wanted was another intermediary, but one who would not ever abandon them. And therefore, they want the intermediary of a, of, of a, of a, of a, 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 a what do you call it, a, 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 the golden calf, which one of the animals in God's chariot, as they speak, you know, their four symbols, is the ox, which is the, uh, the daddy of the calf, which represents serving an ox is there because it represents serving with all your energy. So you're talking about a very high-level desire over here. We want a desire through the intermediary, but that, that itself is idol worship. Now, uh, they say, they, 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 they joke tongue-in-cheek that you see what happened the first time Jews held somebody to start on time. Moshe Rabbeinu, they held Moshe Rabbeinu to be precise and on time. So ever since then, and they had a disaster, so ever since then, Jews have never started anything on time. There's Jewish standard time. You know, everything starts late. Because, because he wasn't a yucky. And every, every, every time, uh, what do you call it, every, every Jewish, every situation there's ever been, uh, you know, every Jewish event is always late. So they say tongue-in-cheek, it's because, uh, tongue-in-cheek is because Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, the, the one time we made him come on time and expected him to be on time, you see what happened. That's why I say tongue-in-cheek. Okay. Now, um, Take off the golden uh, uh, earrings, which are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. They'll view a light and bring them to me. Aaron does something very, very smart over here. What does Aaron do? He says, go get the earrings from your wives. What does he want with the wives? Why does he get the wives developed here? What does Aaron do? Go, go start with your wives. They had all their gold. Why get the golden earrings from your wives? Because they're going to be and, uh, yes, the wives, uh, any good Jewish wife, and husband says, hi, uh, Rachel, can I have your earrings? No, wait. Right, what do you want to do with them? Which earrings? You know, the gold earrings, the one you got me for the engagement? Yeah, 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 let me do, why, what do you want to do with those? You know, she ain't going to surrender it up so fast. Well, you know, we have, uh, we have this project we're working on. No kidding, what kind of project? Uh, it has to do with the gold, we need a lot of gold. Are you planning, uh, well, Rachel, listen, it's worth the cause, it's to serve Hashem. Ooh, he touched a religious vein. Now she gets interested. Really? Wow, my husband's so spiritual. Why, what do you plan on doing? Well, we're going to make this gold calf type of thing. Golden calf? I mean, that's an idol. That doesn't sound good to me. No, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand, sir, you know. And then eventually he's going to have to go and take it by force. I don't understand. Aaron wants to play for time. Aaron is trying to get to a point where he could wait. Let's delay till Moshe Rabbeinu gets back. So first place to start is with the women. You get the golden back. Look what it says. So they take the golden earrings and they bring it to Aaron. He makes it in. He, cha- he binds it up in a cloth. And he makes it into a molten calf. They said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Now, again, this is a classic line. They obviously knew that this wasn't the thing that brought them out of Egypt, but they're saying that this is the thing that's going to be the intermediary to connect with he who brought them out of Egypt. Okay? Now, the word bacheret is a very interesting <coughs> word because bacheret means uh, uh, in a cloth, Apparently, you take the gold and you mold it, you shape it. However, however, gold molders mold gold. I've never, never, never been there. But the word bacheret is related to the Hebrew word charata. What is charata? Regret. What's that? Regret. Regret. Exactly correct. That means even as Aaron is doing it, he's regretting it, and he's regretting being in this situation. Okay, so he makes it this egel charata. He makes this egel now. Vayar Aaron, vayiven mizbeach lefanov. Aaron sees and he builds an altar in front of him. Pasuk hey. And it doesn't say what Aaron sees. It just says Aaron sees and he builds an altar. 
Vayikra Aaron, Vayomar Chag Hashem Mochor. We're going to make a celebration tomorrow. You notice that Aaron's entire attempt here is try to put it off. Try to put it off. Yeah, we're going to celebrate tomorrow. Hopefully, Moshe Rabbeinu will come down in the meantime. Now, Rashi here points out, what was it that Aaron saw? So Rashi says like this, um, that the, 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 the word Mizbeach, if you take a look, Vayomer, Vayar Aaron, Vayiven Mizbeach Lefanov. The word Mizbeach, if you take away the vowels, could also be read as Mizavuach, from the one who has been slaughtered. Vayiven means he understood, from Havana Lehavin, literally the two words, Vayiven Mizbeach, means he built an altar. But if you, the alternative reading would be, Vayiven he understood, Mizavuach Lefanov, from the one who was slaughtered in front of him. Who was slaughtered in front of Aaron? His nephew Hur who had tried stopping the people. Aaron understood that if he tries to protest, the people are going to kill him also. And then all heck is going to break loose. Aaron's in a bad situation. Aaron has to make a choice. It's like triage. You're doing triage over here. Which do you choose? Neither one's a great choice here. Should I allow myself to be killed? Or then they'll all heck will break loose, or should I just go on with this hoping the emotion I can delay things? There'll be a little bit of, 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 of what's it called control, a little bit of damage control over here. It's not an easy choice to make. So Aaron understands it, therefore Aaron says, you know what, I better, I better control the damage over here. The commentaries say also that there's a verse that says, if the Jewish people were to kill the prophet, Aaron was a Navi, they would never have any atonement for it. And therefore Aaron says, this is the lesser of two evils, and I better allow the Jewish people to I better try to maintain damage control. Okay, now the next pasuk is absolutely should give you the goosebumps. It says, They wake up the next morning. They bring offerings, peace offerings. So the people sit down to eat and drink. And then they get up to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, entertain. How does it? To revel. How do you pronounce it? Revel? Revel? Revel. revel. They get up to revel. So Rashi says, the word litzachek, take a look at the second column of Rashi, the left column of Rashi, it's uh, about eight lines from the bottom in the left column of Rashi. Rashi explains what that word litzachek means. Litzachek, yesh b'mashma hazeh gilui arayos. This involves, this word litzachek always carries an implication of immorality. And then Rashi says, ushvichus damim, and uh, 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 blood and, and murder, killing. So the, the murder is there. They killed Khur, right? Uh, but certainly if there's entertainment and there's a party, so parties always get to, eventually it's got to lead to immorality, right? Now, Rev. Weinbach, Rabbi Weinbach is at Sal, was Rosh Hashiva here. He once told us an interesting story. He said he was in the army. He had to do, uh, what's it called, uh, Miluim in the Israeli army. He was a man in his, he was already in his late 40s. And he had finished his duties for the day, and he was, uh, he was in his tent at night. And he was learning. He had a Gemara with him. He was learning. And one of the other Miluim guys says, hey, Weinbach, you want to come with us? There's a party. So he says, uh, no, no, thanks, I'll pass. So the guy says, why? So he says to him, because the nature of parties is that they always descend to their lowest common denominator. So the guy says, all right, suit yourself, and he walks out. Comes back 45 minutes later and he looks at me shaking his head and says, You were right. It descended to its lowest common denominator. Right? That's the nature of parties. You guys have been in college campuses. You know what goes on. And you know, when there's alcohol and there's, they're, they're celebrating, you know, that's okay. Now, there's something remarkable that's contained in this post. One of the commentaries points out, just, just really giving you the goosebumps. The Jewish people with the golden calf represents any time the Jewish people substitute some alternative form of worship for authentic worship. There's an authentic form of worship. Serve God without idols, without intermediaries, and so on. Anytime there's a substitution, anytime there's a substitution in any area of life, any ism that's ever existed in the history of the world, how does it always begin? The first thing is vayalu olos. Vayalu olos means they bring burnt offerings. A burnt offering is an offering that's burnt in the base of Mikdash, where the animal is totally burnt on the altar. Okay? That's where it starts. Total devotion for the cause. Vayagishu shlomim. Then they bring shlomim offerings. 
Shlomim offerings, part are burnt, and part are eaten by the person who's brought the offering. So already there's something in it for me. Then the people get involved in total self uh, uh, gratification of eating and drinking. And where does that always lead to? And then they get involved in immorality. Every movement in the world follows, follows that pattern. We're totally devoted. Our devotion is tapered a little bit. Hey, there's some fringe benefits here. Then we push away everything and only take the fringe benefits. And then if you stick with it, eventually you descend into the lowest forms of behavior. Every movement in history has been that way. The, uh, somebody once pointed out revolutions through history. Any revolution has always been great at uniting people. Revolutions are great at uniting people. You know what the problem with revolutions is? Eventually they succeed. That's when the fighting starts. We have nothing that, we don't have anybody fight. Now we got to start living. You know, we got to start deciding how to divide up the spoils. Oh, that, that's where all the trouble begins. That's where all the trouble begins. That was very much the history of settling this country. When the people first came to settle the land of Israel, swamp land, and you had to drain the swamps and live on kibbutzim and fight the Arabs and fight the marauders. and, and build. It was all, Everybody's sort of good at a cause. Things started becoming a little bit more, uh, a little bit more settled. People are starting to take, take uh, what do you call it? They're starting to take dividends. Right? Then eventually the country comes completely uh, uh, technologically advanced and they can produce their own stuff and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, we, you know, now it's just a question of who's going to grab a bigger piece of the pie. It, once you have time on your hands with no clear goal, so then what do you do? Then you look for entertainment. And entertainment always leads to immorality. That's the nature, that's the nature of the world. A person who sticks to entertainment long enough, sometimes we don't have enough time because we have to go to work the next day, but a person who's got only time on his hands for entertainment, then eventually he gets to the point where he sinks to the lowest levels. Okay, now, by Dabra Hashem al Moshe, God says to Moshe, Lech Reid, go down. Your nation who you brought out of Egypt has, has become corrupted. They've done wrong. They have quickly strayed from the path which I commanded them. They made a calf. They bowed down to it. Now, they are stiff-necked people, which is true. Jews are a stiff-necked people. Now, stiff, being stiff-necked, by the way, has a positive and a negative. Being stiff-necked is one of the reasons we're still here today. You know, we, you know, we have a society that's pressuring us, and we have had people trying to kill us, and there are Jews been willing to die. The Jews are definitely a stiff-necked people. Jews don't like being told what to do. And, uh, 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 you know, sometimes it's just, you know, I'll do it if I want to do it, but not if, not if you tell me to do it. And therefore, uh, they're an Am Kshayorif. But here they're being an Am Kshayorif as well. Now allow me, and I will destroy them. I'll make you into a great nation. Now, you see in this passage, the way God addresses Moshe Rabbeinu, what's God really asking for? He says, please allow me, and I will destroy the Jewish people. What does allow me mean? Allow me means you have some way of not allowing me. You have some way of restraining me. Because Ruch is inviting Moshe Rabbeinu to plead on behalf of the Jewish people. That's why he says, allow me. Otherwise, there's no need, there's no need to say, allow me. Allow me means you have some, if, if I say to you, well, if my wife lets me, right, if my wife lets me, then I'll go with you on the trip. That means that, uh, that there is somebody who could stop me. Right? That's what Hashem is saying. Allow me, if, if, if you allow me, I'm going to destroy the people. So Moshe Rabbeinu hears in that, that Hashem is saying, well, do whatever a human being can to not allow me, which is what? There's only one thing a human can do. And one thing you could do, prayer. He goes through this whole this whole prayer. Prayer. He goes through this whole prayer, and then the last pasuk pasuk Yodalid Vayinochem Hashem Al Rosh Yedibel Al Zosh Hashem retracted from his the plans that he had. Okay. Now here, that's the prayer of Moshe Rabbeinu. Now in the next four pesukim we are going to see several insights into various aspects of human behavior. Vayifen vayered Moshe minahar. Moshe turns to go down, ushde luchos ha'idus biyado, and he has got the two tablets in his hand. Luchos ksuvim ishte avrem mizeh mizehim ksuvim. The luchos which are written on both sides. 
Ve'aluchos ma'asei Elokim heima, they are made by God. Ve'amichtov michtov ve'elokim hul chorus al haluchos, and carved on the luchos. Now, Vayishma, Moshe is with his, his, his disciple Yoshua. Now, pay attention carefully. 498, top line. Vayishma Moshe Yehoshua es kol ha'ombereo. Yehoshua hears the people in its sound of shouting. This word reo is not badness, ra, it's not from ra, it's from like trua. Like a trua on a chauffeur, it's kia, trua is a sound. Reo is in their yowling, in their howling, in their, in their yelling. Vayomer el Moshe kol milchama b'machana. There is the sound of battle in the camp. Vayomer Moshe says, "Ain kol anos gvura." That is not the sound of victorious people yelling. Vein kol anos chalusha. And nor is it the sound of the defeated crying out. Kol anos anochi sholeh. Anochi sholeh. It is simply a sound of the arts. Go translate as distress. It's just the sound of uncontrolled yelling. Now, the commentaries point out over here, this is a very interesting conversation that takes place between Moshe and Yoshua. What's Yoshua's role going to be? Be leader of the... Be leader of the Jewish people. Moshe Rabbeinu was saying to Yoshua, you know something? Right off the bat, Yoshua, you're going to have to learn something. A leader, to qualify for a leader, you need to hear the sound of your people. Sound of the people nowadays is called... A, 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 a survey. Right? Nowadays, they take surveys. Sound of the people means pick up the mood. Where are the people going? A good leader understands there are certain things I could push and certain things I can't push. Certain things I could tell the people to do. Certain things the people will obey. Certain things the people are not going to obey. If you become a rabbi of a shul and you would like to make changes like many rabbis have, you have to know there are certain changes you could push and certain changes you're not going to be able to push. You'd better hear the sound of the people. So if you decide, all right, you know, we are going to push a mechitza in our shul. Right, you may be able to get it. You know, you, you could pick up the flow, you pick up the mood. We are going to push that everybody in shul has to wear a black hat and jacket. Uh, you, better, uh, you better find yourself a new job. Uh, that just is not going to make it over here. And a wise politician, a wise leader senses just how much can I push things over here, how much, if you hear yelling, when you're a parent, you'll know that in your back room, you're yelling, the kids are, the kids are playing, there are certain types of even just laughter, there's a good laughter and there's a wild laughter, it crosses a line, there's good laughter, there's wild laughter, and there's naughty laughter. And sometimes, you know, you hear the kids are giggling around, <laughs> all of a sudden you hear a type of laugh which means Either somebody's pants are down, right, in the back room, or one of the babies took off their diaper and everybody's having a good time with the contents, and you could tell by the laughter that something naughty is happening. And all you got to do is pick that up, and you could tell by the tone. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Yeshua, that is not the sound of a war. That's the sound of trouble, not the sound of a war. There's a very big difference. There's a very big difference. You can hear a couple of guys sitting on a bench. You ever listen to the difference between, uh, between guys and girls? Girls are sitting on a bench, you know, and about, you could have four or five, six girls sitting on a bench, and all you hear is all six of them chattering at the same time. Five guys are sitting on a bench, you get one guy is talking, four guys are listening in quietly, and all of a sudden they all explode in laughter. And you know, just a whole bunch of them just explode in laughter. And you can tell by the laughter exactly how off color it was what the guy just said. There's a, there's a certain tone that you could pick up. That's what a leader has to pick up. The leader has to pick up what's really going on over there by the people. What is that sound? And he says to Yeshua, it's not the sound of battle. It's not the sound of people who won. It's not the sound of people who lost. It's the sound of trouble. It's a troublemaking sound over there in the camp. Okay? So what does he do? When Moshe got to the camp, he got close to the camp, and he saw the calf, and he saw the, 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 the circles, the dances. Moshe got angry. Moshe Rabbeinu burns the luchos at the foot of the mountain. He throws down the tablets, and he burns the, he, he, he breaks them, sorry, breaks, not burns them, he breaks them at the, at the foot of the mountain. Now, very interesting question here. Is this the first time Moshe became aware that they were doing something wrong? When did he become aware of it? Hashem told him. Hashem said, the people have gone off. They made a golden calf. So why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu break the luchos right, right away? Why did Moshe Rabbeinu wait till he came down? 
to show the people that he's breaking luchos. Okay, that's that's probably that's probably one of the reasons. Probably one of the reasons to show the people that the luchos have been smashed. Okay, that's not the main reason brought down by Rashi. Take a look at Rashi. Did Moses know that they were doing idol worship? God told him. I, God. Didn't, I didn't hear that. I didn't see that um, God told um, Moses that they were doing specifically idol worship. It says the letters flew up, yeah. Um, it says, Kishiche Sangwe, your people were, went corrupt, they, they strayed off the path, they made an ego masecha, they bowed to him, they sacrificed him, they said, This is your God, is Hashem tells him everything that they did. So, we, what's that? The first Dibra was the Lo Yelecha Elohim Kherim. Right. If you would give them the tablet, so it's like the message they. Okay, so, so okay, well, uh-huh, so he wants to break it before, so why didn't he break it earlier? I don't see it over here, but we learn from here that a judge has to see things, not enough to hear it, you have to see it, you have to see, you're, you've heard there's a problem, don't make the judgment until you have the facts clear, until you see it. Yeah, you heard it from our Kodesh Baruch that's the lesson, the lesson is even if you heard it from Hashem, Wait until you're in a position where you could judge it based on your own based on your own eyes. Obviously, the judge doesn't actually see the crime, but you, you to get to the point where it, where as much as you can to get the facts of the case before you judge the case. But you heard, "Ooh, this is terrible." Then you come down and you see it. The people now I got to break it. I see with my own eyes that the people are that the people are doing it. Okay, so now Moshe decides he's going to have to punish the people. Um, and the those who sinned, those who sinned. What do you call it? And they're, 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 those are, some are executed by the sword, and some are executed. Uh, what do you call it? Some are executed by the sword, and some are executed by the uh, by drinking the water, and, uh, and some are executed by the plague. Okay. Now, tra- to go on ahead. Go on ahead um, to page five o four. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, in verse thirteen. If I find favor in your eyes, let me know your ways, that I shall know you, that I find favor in your eyes. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to see you, whatever that means. I want to see you as clearly as possible. So what is Hashem's response? Top of the next page. Shem says to Moshe like this, starting from Pasuk 20. Vayomer lo sucha leroses ponai. Pasuk chof. Vayomer lo sucha leroses ponai. Ki lo yirani adam v'chai. You cannot see my face, whatever that means. Ki lo yirani adam v'chai. No man can see me and live. What does that mean? No man can see me and live. Mean not allowed. What 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 is it? What, what is the what do the words mean? Lo your ani adam v'chai. No man can see me and live. What does that mean? So the idea is like this. Have you ever been in a situation? Uh, sugar is a good example. Uh, 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 you ever eat something sweet, and then say so eat something that's even sweeter, and something's even sweeter. I mean, you're taking something so good, you get to a point where something is so sweet, it's like, wow, this is so sweet, I'm going to explode from sweetness. I, I just can't take it anymore. It's so sweet. I'm only using sweet as an example. Uh, uh, if you want a better example, heroin. Right? Body could only take a certain amount. And you can put in more, you'll feel good for a while, but then you die. Right? There's a certain limit that the body could, ha- could handle. The neshama is attracted to God. To the degree of closest, the, the Gemara even says that when a tzaddik dies, when a tzaddik dies, the way a tzaddik dies is he is given a clear picture of the divine presence, and his neshama just goes to it. The neshama just drifts to it, leaves his body, and he dies. Like those flies that go to the zappy thing? Like the flies that go to the zappy thing, sort of, except with a much better, with a much better conclusion. Right, the, the the neshama goes to the light and he has so has a, has a better conclusion than, than the flies on the zappy thing. So so the neshama is almost drawn out like a magnet. That's one of the one of the comparisons that they make. It's drawn out like a magnet to the source of takosh Lo Loyerani adav means Hashem is saying, if I show you 
my full essence, as much as a human being, my full essence, the full essence is of such a magnificent goodness that the body wouldn't be able to contain the soul. It's not a punishment. It's just not possible. Your physical body cannot contain the neshama under circumstances that it's exposed to that sort of uh, 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 revelation of God. Therefore, lo yirani ha'odam v'chai. Nobody can see me and live. However, there is a place by me you will stand in the rock, in the, in the cave. I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I will put my hands upon you until I pass. You, I will move my hand. You will see my back. <laughs> what does that mean? God's got a hand and a face and a back. And a, you know, and we're talking about the, 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 the ultimate in intangibility. What does any of that mean? So the commentary is explained like this. First of all, what I told you is that, 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 that a pure exposure to the essence of God, a person would not be able to handle on a physical level. The neshama would just be, neshama would just be drawn out. The Gemara says, the neshama of the tzaddik leaves the body like taking a strand of hair out of milk. Let's say you have a strand of hair and it's floating around a cup of milk. You pull out the strand of hair out of the milk. That's what they're taking the neshama out of a tzaddik's body is, meaning that it leaves, it, 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 it takes nothing with it. Shama of Russia is compared to pulling a clump of cotton that's got stuck in a thorn bush. You got to pull that clump of cotton out of a thorn bush. What happens when you pull cotton out of a thorn bush? Some of the cotton gets, first of all, it's an unpleasant experience for the cotton, if cotton could speak. Second of all, uh, uh, it, a part of the cotton is left behind. Right? Now, what that symbolically means is part of the suffering of the, of, of the wicked in the world to come is a person's neshama has been so dominated by his physical existence that he wants what's in this world. And when his neshama leaves him, he goes to the world to come, living with the desire for this world, but it's not accessible to him. That's an eternal frustration. The guys in the world of truth and he's looking for the various interests that he had in this world. And it's not there. It's not there. That's the eternal frustration. I just had a, I just had a, a dream the other night. I had to give a lecture somewhere. And I, I couldn't find my notes. You know, and it's one of those dreams where you're just getting frustrated. Somebody took you. probably had those before midterms. Did anybody see my notes? You know, my, where my site, and, you know, and then you're all of a sudden your Aunt Harriet shows up and she's holding the notes when she gets in her car and drives away. You know, next thing, and one of those weird, completely weird, weird dreams. But at the end of the day, that you wake up with a frustration. Mm. You try to go to sleep so you can finish it off well. And then it doesn't happen because your Uncle Harold comes too. You know, you know something, something like that. You know, the dream, it doesn't, that frustration it, it, it is only a, an inkling of the fr eternal frustration of a rush of the world of truth. You're looking for this in this world. You're looking for, for your, 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 your worldly pleasures, and they're not accessible to you. A tzaddik is like the hair drawn out of water. He has nothing. He doesn't leave. He has no, no attachment whatsoever to this world. Therefore, he's able to enjoy the, 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 the world of truth completely. That's, What's that? What's that? So that's, I think the example of Gamora is the assumption is the milk will just go sliding right off the hair and it comes out. And they're easily identifiable. You can pull it out. The idea is that the hair, that the milk won't stay on it. The milk will just drip, 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 drip right off. Yeah. Well, is there an answer why you can't see the Rabbi Shmuel's face? That's the idea. The idea. The idea. The, 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 well, why? One idea. There's another idea here. The other idea of the face, where it says you can't see my front, but you can see my back. So when I, that's the last thing. I, I want to get to this point. Thank you. Commentaries point out, you cannot see my front, but you can see my back, means human beings cannot understand the ways of God as they are unfolding. It's only afterwards, with some hindsight, that we can get a glimpse into what God was doing. You can't see my front, you can see my back. That means after the fact, after it's over and you look back, then you could get a little inkling into how things played out often in your favor. So the classic example is, I always wondered, why does Esther have to be an orphan girl? In the Megillah story, her father and mother dies, and Mordechai adopts her. What's that got to do with the story? Well, why, why does it have to be? What's it got to be in the story? Number one. Number two, 
How didn't they know she was Jewish? I mean, they took her out of Mordechai's house. He's the leader of the Jewish people. She's wearing a skirt down to her ankles. You got everybody else is running around and running around in bathing suits, and she's got a, she got a skirt down to her ankles. She's got her hair in a ponytail. She's wearing a she's wearing hose, a big black black hose. You know, you know, no makeup. And she, I shot base Yaakov girl. I mean, what, what, what do you think she is? Irish? She isn't right. No, no, no. So, so what do you what do you, what do you think she is? Right? She's not Italian. So what do, what do you think? Right? The answer is the answer is that the two questions are are linked together. You see. They came to Mordechai's house, and there's a girl there. And Mordechai said, yeah, I adopted her. I adopted her. Well, what's her background? I don't know. She's an orphan. Her parents died. Poor girl, I adopted her. Well, what nationality is she? King, king wants a, king, the king oh, they wants a purebred over here. We can't have some doubt. I don't know. I mean, she went to Beis Yaakov, and she makes Kiddush. You know, she, I, I raised her. Yeah, she behaves Jewish, and she's officially Jewish now because she had a, she, we can murder her. Yeah, but that's not good enough. Where is she from? I, I don't know. And you see, you see that this is God's way. Then she's able to go to the palace. She doesn't reveal she's Jewish because nobody knows. Nobody knows who she is. She doesn't tell. And it's only when she's got to spring the trap on Haman that she's able to spring, that she springs the trap. So now let's go back. What was the event? Her parents died. What do you think anybody living in that, in that block was thinking when her parents died? Oh, terrible. Oh, yeah, another tragedy. Oh, terrible. Till when? Till the Jewish people are saved. I was just like, ah, oh. oh, now I understand. Now it starts to make a little more sense. That's what it means. You see God from behind, not from the front. Yeah. While it's happening, I don't know, you ever been to those mystery movies? While it's happening in the movie, I don't, you don't know what's happening. Also, you get to the last, last scene, and also it's like, oh, oh, he was a bad guy. Oh, he was a good guy. Oh, that's why she killed him. Oh, oh, he never died. Oh, and it all starts to make, after the fact, it starts to, so when God says, you can see me from the back, that means sometimes with hindsight, even on a personal level, I might be in a good situation right now. Oh, you know what? I remember when I got fired from that job, I wasn't so happy. But it's only because I got fired from that job that I ended up stepping, stepping into seven figures right now. Uh-huh, okay. All right. Starting to get a, little, get a little insight. That's the idea. All right. All right.